coming to hear um, Sandra Mazeros in conversation with gallery director Sarah Nelman. I just want to say something about my relationship with Sandra because when I was thinking about it, I think it was about 18 years ago when Sandra was a then student at Ontario College of Art, uh, maybe before, and design, I'm not sure. There was design then, OCAD. We would always go to the graduate shows, and that year, every graduate year didn't produce something that made you think was fabulous, but that year there was this real underlying excitement about this extraordinary artist, and that person was Sandra Mazeros. So I was the lucky person to be able to then ask her and have her accept doing a show. So that's how long our relationship goes back, and it's pretty exciting for me to see today how much uh, Sandra has developed, how many bodies of work she has made um, as an artist with a studio practice, and at the same time juggling a, a job being a professor at Alberta College of Art. So with that, I also thank you for coming, and I'm really excited to hear two intelligent art world talkers <laughs> to talk with you this evening. Thank you. Welcome, please, Sandra Mazeros and Sarah Nelman. <laughs> Sandra, I know that this work began and largely developed as um, you were um, carrying out a residency at mm -hmm. the International Studio and Curatorial Program in New York, a very prestigious residency um, mm -hmm. last summer. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we might start just by hearing a little bit about uh, the development of the project in that context. Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the things that I think is important to start with is, so there's kind of two bodies of work in the exhibition that fold onto each other. And uh, this residency that Sarah is talking about in New York, um, for me was really linked to, well, I applied for the residency based on an exhibition I was in in New York City the summer before, um, which was on artist books. And I had made a body of work collage based that was like very much a body of work that I, I saw as being something that was going to expand and I was looking for ways to think about like where that was going to go. And so when I did this residency in New York, it was really interesting because I had started, um, so some of these small kneeling women I had like started and I brought with me to New York. And I also was starting to think about like how is this work going to start to shift? There's a reference to um, how I'm using existing ephemera, like printed matter out in the world. And so for me, going to New York for this residency was ex like pretty much about me just in a very, um, I think, uh, kind of days of thinking like, oh, I'm just going to go to New York and I'm going to find all these vintage books and I'm going <laughs> to take them all apart. And it was actually really, really difficult to source material. Uh, but I was very persistent, and uh, so I really used New York as a place where I started to like find more material that I was going to be using, and specifically uh, books from like the 1950s, 40s, 50s. I was really interested in, and um, the small kneeling women are from a very specific series of uh, photo instructional manuals from the 50s. Um, they're not intended to be anything other than learn how to light a subject. Um, and I was already starting to think a lot about like these images are really complicated and super layered and problematic in a lot of ways. And I found myself wanting to respond to these in a certain way in terms of thinking about what are these subjects, predominantly women, doing in these images. And so I was able, when I was in New York, to find like many more um, copies of this book and start to kind of think about how the work was going to shift a bit. And then at the same time found this other book, um, which is the red works that are um, up here in the gallery. And that body of work very much was focused on this really specific erotica collection that existed in New York. 
and um, it's quite a notorious uh, erotica collection. And I was doing research at the New York Public Library image uh, collection, and a lot of those images were in that. And I was just trying to think a lot about sort of like, okay, what are these books, and how do I want to respond to them in the studio? Um, and I don't know if I should go whoa, if I should go deeper, or we could talk about yeah. some other things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think. Um, one of the things that this exhibition has been able to do is to draw those two bodies of work mm -hmm. together and to really think about the way that they relate to one another. And the mm -hmm. way you've chosen to um, work with the material is really interesting as a response. So um, having talked a little bit about the source material, one is ostensibly about um, uh, instructing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and one is um, more transparently um, erotic material mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and in the in the black and white works or the monochrome works um, you've um, you have this strategy of sort of erasure mm -hmm. it, it someone has described it to me as violent I don't know if I see it as violent but mm -hmm. it's definitely mm -hmm. um, a kind of bold blocking out mm -hmm. of parts of the image um, and with the red works it feels more like you're highlighting mm -hmm. certain parts of mm -hmm. the image and I wonder if you could talk about um, the relation of those approaches. Mm -hmm. So I think it is really interesting to think about. So these images, like the kneeling women or the blacked out uh, images, again, it is important to highlight, like these are not intended to be erotic images or sexually charged images. Um, and for me, I just was like, I'm, I'm getting these books with all these images of women on their knees and starting to think about power dynamics and like, what exactly is being communicated in these images? And for me, what became really a part of my dialogue with these images was, what happens if I simultaneously cancel out but then highlight something within these images? And a big part of, I would say, both bodies of work, but it started with the blacking out, is how, in this day and age that we live in, how do you slow an image down? That was like my main objective was, these images can be consumed so quickly. I find them to be problematic in the ways that they're representing female sexuality and uh, gender. And what I was really interested in is like in the like act of blacking out, which I see as very performative. And um, like on the small scale ones and the large scale ones, the really important thing is, is I work very quickly. Um, it's not a drawn out process. I would say the sourcing the material and figuring out materials is a drawn out part, but um, the actual act of trying to black it out is to me like a very, I think maybe that's where the violence is. Like if, mm -hmm. you know, like in this performative act as a woman, as a female artist, trying to engage with this imagery of these women and try to negotiate uh, like within these images, the interesting thing to me is like I'm, taking away those like easy, quick signifiers. So we don't know what hair color these women are. We don't know, we don't have a sense of like their identities in like a, I guess in a cliched way, um, but it really highlights the part of the images that are like problematic or we start to question them and what the certain things that are being acted out. And people may notice that in, this was a thing that was really apparent in these images when I started to collect them is during this time period, specifically in these instructional manuals as well as erotica, there was always models being posed in ways where they were using their own bodies to censor their bodies. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was just like, I, I felt shocked by that. Like this idea that women were using their own hands and like blocking their face. So there's a lot of images that aren't in the exhibition but inform this work where, um, in these manuals where the women would put hands in front of their faces to have their photo taken or hands in front of like their pubic area and they would also like collage out or um, somehow kind of like it would just sort of disappear certain things within the female body um, and to me I wanted to highlight that like what what is that happening yeah. in these images yeah. yeah yeah I mean I think this might be an interesting point to draw it back also to some of your own experiences mm -hmm. as well, and mm -hmm. to think about where this work was coming from mm -hmm. um, in terms of your experiences in the world. So Sandra, for those of you who may not know, teaches at the Alberta College of Art and Design, 
and she got this job quite soon after graduating mm -hmm. um, from her master's mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. um, amazing job to have, beat out a lot of people for this role, um, is an incredible teacher, uh, and also maintains a really active studio practice, which is really hard to do, really, really hard to do. It's like having two full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. um, we, we went through this with her while she made this <laughs> yes. work, and it was a lot, it was, but anyway. Um, but I know your experience in the kind of institution of academia, mm -hmm. um, and maybe beyond that as well, um, also, um, put you in a space where you were thinking a lot about yeah. um, gender and power dynamics and expectations. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you might um, tell us how that inflected um, uh, sort of where this work came from. Yeah. So to me, like the kneeling women that so it came before the Red Works is, to me, it was very much this. And I've shared lots of discussions with uh, Sarah and Jane about this is feeling kind of like nothing has changed <laughs> in terms of gender roles, expectations, being forced into certain dynamics and power dynamics in general. And I think academia is like a very fertile uh, space for um, all kinds of questionable things. And um, so for myself, I think that I really felt like I was in a position as much as like um, both personally and professionally, like I'm super vocal and outspoken and I uh, talk about uh, being a feminist artist and like the sorts of things I'm doing with my work, but that I found myself in situations where I did not feel like I had agency or power or, or like any sort of sense of kind of like where things were going to go. Um, and so really I identified a lot with the kneeling women. Like I was kind of like, and there's like things within the images, I think that like they shift in terms of like what they're communicating through their bodies. And to me, like I, I always like to point out this uh, piece over here. It kind of is the punctuation, I think, in these larger works. Um, and I'm really fond of this model because she's the only one that doesn't have her hands on her body. She's kind of like in this pose that's sort of like what the f, <laughs> or like what's going on, or you know, like she's very much like an exclamation point, I think, in terms of like how she's using her body to kind of question mm -hmm. what those things are. Um, so for me, it was really like I identified with these bodies. I, I identified with what they're communicating. And then if I was to kind of like, you know, extend that to the red works, um, when I went to New York, mm -hmm. being away from academia, <laughs> being, you know, like in this very different environment, I felt free. In a, in a very particular way. And I found myself really thinking about, um, obviously I was like working on this work, but I became really interested in this idea of like, okay, these images that I'm appropriating are from male photographers exclusively. Um, and in the Red Works, predominantly anonymous photographers. Um, and I found myself thinking a lot about, I needed to insert some humor into it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, to kind of cope with it all. Um, and I think with the Red Works, what was really interesting is like that um, erotica collection is like really, it's been mass produced and like printed and lots of volumes of books and you see it everywhere. Um, and to me, I became really interested in this idea of like the camp and the drama and the sort of ways in which those images exist very differently from these where they're aware of their, uh, what they're communicating. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if people have had a chance to look at them, but they're very staged, and they're, they, you know, there's certain props and ways that you know, the subjects are um, sort of lined up in certain ways. And to me, what I thought was really humorous, like the, with the large red work when you were, uh, walk in, is um, there's these ways in which the images exist where you don't know what happened before or what's going to happen after, but there are the, these really awkward scenarios, say, for instance, in that image where the one female subject, first of all, I love that they're both wearing two-piece pajamas and, and that one of them sort of like has this like very awkward hand on the buttocks of the other and it's kind of like, I'm going to spank her, but it's not believable and it's like kind of like they're like frozen in this erotic moment for a male gaze, but it's, to me, what was really interesting was thinking about, okay, how can I as a female artist through performing through these images 
somehow highlight what would be the erotic moment like for the subject mm -hmm. and give them that and so for me there was like just things about like touch and like thinking about like if a hand was touching skin or there's somewhere like the subject's wearing leather or there's like just little details um, that to me were really important to be like okay if I cancel out all of this other information slash highlight it then it kind of puts the, it, it recontextualizes the mm -hmm. images and yep. renegotiates them. Again, with like all this humor, like a detail I was I, bringing up to a lot of people at the opening was, in a lot of those images, one of my favorite parts of this collection is a lot of the women are wearing watches, so they're completely nude. <laughs> and then they're kind of like, what time is it? Like it's, you know, like it's closing time, like I'm done being erotic, like, you know, like I want my paycheck, I'm done. And to me, that was really an amazing detail in these images to see that they have watches on. And so, I, I don't know, like I think there's something in that that then, I think the red works can sort of like be a foil to the kneeling women where like it all is kind of ridiculous, but like, you know, like there's yeah. something in that that yeah. I'm really yeah. interested in, that tension. They feel, the red works feel more, consciously performative, yes. as you said, and more yeah. collaborative, perhaps, yeah. in that way. Um, and, uh, and also lighthearted in, yeah. in a certain kind of a way because of that as mm -hmm. well. Um, I wonder, you've, you've touched on this a little bit, but I wonder if you can say a little bit about the significance of performativity and feminist mm -hmm. performance art, mm -hmm. um, not only to your thinking as an mm -hmm. artist, but in fact, mm -hmm. to um, the action of making some of these mm -hmm. works as mm -hmm. well, because I know that's important for you. Yeah, like I think, like in saying I really relate to these bodies, it's always important to be like, how am I relating to my own body? Like, and, and you know, like it's very different the kind of scale of like performing with the smaller ones versus the larger ones. But I think there's always this like attempt to have some sort of gestural sort of passing through. To me, that's like really, and I had mentioned this, but like speed is really important to me. I think whenever I try to be precious and like kind of be really, you know, like, oh, I'm like, I'm moving through, it never, it ruins the image. And um, so for me, there's something about the ways in which I make these gestures. They're really intuitive. Like with the red works, I was like really, um, like I literally would like, psych myself up for hours, <laughs> but the actual act of doing it had to be quick because I needed, and I didn't strategize where I would highlight the red in those ones at all. Um, and I think to me that kept some sort of a narrative that was like really linked to like, for lack of a better way to explain, sort of what I was going through emotionally, that I could transfer into that performative act. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm always conscious of that kind of idea of like, what's going on for myself and how that can kind of translate through materials. And, and also I think the other thing to really keep in mind is like people always bring this up to me, but like I'm really cavalier with how I use like ephemera. So like people are always kind of like, uh, like I was posting on Instagram when I was making some of the work for this show and people would DM me right away being like, oh my God, why did you just put black all over that image? And I was like, yeah, that's what, and that's a part of it for me is like the beautiful parts of the image I'm oftentimes covering up. And I think there's something in that, that, that even the resist that I have to it of being like, oh, I really love that detail, but like I'm going to black it out or... Because to me, again, those are the quick parts of it. And I, and I think there's something in not being precious with the original like 50s paper versus like these which are like scaled up. Like there's something in that kind of like just going into it and like not, not knowing that's like important yeah. to me in the performance part of it. In the performance yeah. part of it, yeah. 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 I have a question for you, Sam. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> about sexism in the workplace, and yeah. um, I, I don't know how the audience responds in, in terms of whether or not um, that, that's successful as people look at it, and I, I will ask that question after, but I, obviously you experienced that from the moment you started teaching in Alberta, mm -hmm. and something gave you the agency to be able to bring forward the kind of work now, mm -hmm. which, which you didn't bring forward five years ago, mm -hmm. say, um, and, and that you 
you were able to do it using your own archive in some mm -hmm. instances to make your artwork. So talk about what inspired you at this moment in your life to really be able to be that confident with this kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it was like when I mentioned this exhibition I was in in New York where I made this book work, that was sort of the site of, like, so Jane's referencing an archive, and it's like, I was invited to an exhibition at this space in uh, New York called Fortnite Institute. Um, it's run by two women who work in commercial galleries in Chelsea, and they're really, they're these powerhouse sort of female gallery workers that also, like, have a real interest in, like, books and publishing and self-publishing, and I was really, I think being in that show and like being in a show with like artists like Marilyn Mincher and Rita Ackerman and like these are people obviously I look up to and like I really admire and going to, and Carmen Winan who's like also in the Contact Photo Festival, um, going and interacting with like changing my uh, setting and sort of being in a different community and like starting to think about even just like uh, there's like a whole other culture around like books and self-publishing and archives and thinking about printed matter and ephemera in New York that's like really uh, rigorous and like energetic. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I like really tapped into that. Like I was just like, oh my God, I'm in this show. I'm meeting all these people. It's really interesting. And of course, at the same time, I was teaching and like making things in the studio, but I found like I just wanted more. And I kind of, I felt like there was something about, I'm trying to think of how to say this. I sort of just was like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I, yeah. like, that's the only way to articulate. I just stopped caring about a whole bunch of things and just was like, I'm just going for it. Like, and it, it really happened quite quickly. Um, I think with that one work, which Jane has some of the collages from that work, is like I literally was invited to the. Sh I always want to kind of tell this story because it's sort of insane. Is like I was invited to the show, made the work, which was this archive of images, which had over like a hundred and something different components to it. So original collages, collected. Uh, vintage ephemera and I made it all in four weeks and was on a plane to New York to like deliver it to the gallery and I think I s really shocked myself <laughs> like I was just like oh right this is what happens when you don't care about stupid stuff and you just like are determined and you get things done and then I just was really f um, focused I think in a way that um, I haven't been like I just didn't give my energy to those things that were like kind of taking away from. And I think in terms of, because I know it keeps coming into play this idea of like sexism in the workplace. And I mean, sexism exists everywhere. And it's like, uh, yeah, this is the dialogue we keep having is like, I think that we have to be vocal. And I just started to be really vocal and start to do projects and like collaborations. And I finally kind of felt like, I had a, I don't know, like I, I was playing a role in a different way than I was before. You, you took your own agency. Yeah, you know, in yeah. This, in the same way, you're, it, these works become a kind of metaphor for that yes. moment in your life, yeah. if I may Yeah, no, suggest. of course, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and that, I mean, the most recent phase of development for this work is these larger scale works. Yes. And I, and I think it's worth saying something about what scale does for these images, yeah. right? um, mm -hmm. especially if we think about the original contexts for these work. They could be secreted away in pockets, they could yeah. be hidden, they were very intimate experiences, and scale really mm -hmm. changes that. Mm -hmm. So it is really interesting because it's like, um, so way back when uh, predominantly all the work I made was like massively scaled work, like 14 foot drawings, and, and it was really funny because this moment of like complete uh, sort of a, like a radical shift in my practice and my life and my working life is when all of a sudden it's funny that I went super small scale. <laughs> and, and it really, again, like uh, was linked to that exhibition where I had to kind of put it under my arm and get on a plane. And I was really interested in this idea of so much of this like material I was collecting is of a certain scale that's like, yeah, pocket size, like put it in your purse. 
and I became really interested in this idea of Chu. Like I used the actual um, leather portfolio that I had made for that book work in New York. I started to use it to transport everything when I went to residencies and I went to exhibitions. And then it was really interesting how quickly then, of course, everyone's like, what would these look like bigger? And I was like, OK. Uh, you know. And uh, it's been a process that's like, I would say, to date is a full year. So yeah. this is where it seems like a really easy thing to do, to be like, oh, you just blew that up to this size. And it's like, it's not easy. <laughs> um, it's also something that was way out of my comfort zone. Um, I had to work with someone to, who really knows uh, how to work with photographic images in a certain way. And again, I bring this up because I'm always like intuitive and work with speed. And this was so slow, this process. And it was really, yeah, I found myself very frustrated by it at times. But what was really interesting is realizing these bodies to be life size. So like to me, that was something that became really interesting for me is like, then making the large ones, they were my scale all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And I could really like relate to them in a totally different way. Um, and there was all kinds of things in terms of like trying to troubleshoot that in the gallery or in the studio. It's like the other thing I always, it's funny to like see work up in a gallery. You're like, oh, it looks great. Look at all this space. My studio is <laughs> literally like, you know, it's very small. And so I made these all sort of like just me basically working like on a flat surface sort of over top of them. And that was really interesting because I only ever saw them sort of from like this like bird's eye view. Um, and I really didn't know what was going to happen in terms of how the images like interact with the ink. Um, like people may notice it say with the smaller ones, and I'm really interested in this in both bodies of work, how the images resist whatever I apply to them. And they'll come through in different ways. And this isn't something I can control. I don't know how it's going to go. Um, I have no idea why the little ones, these ghosts, come through the ink. There's no explanation. I've tried to talk to so many people about it. But to me, I really love that idea of like how the images fight with the materials and what I'm performing through them. And the same with the larger ones. There's ghosts that happen too, or these certain things that start to shift in terms of the images. And to me, that like there's something also that's interesting about all of the work where as the materials settle, the images shift even more over time. Because um, I literally can ink things in the studio, and then I'll be like, oh, there's no ghosts. And then two weeks later, all these women appear through the ink. And I'm like, what's happening? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really, and it was the same with the large ones. They, they really didn't, they were kind of unruly and very wild to work on. And they became really warped. And then they were put in a, a heat press. And then all of a sudden, it was like, oh, there they are. And so, like, to me, there's something in that that kind of, yeah, that resists mm -hmm. to me is really interesting with the scale as One well. One of the lovely surprises of the large ones as well, for me, is that be because of the, the way that you, um, you have these black blocks mm -hmm. um, and the scale of the images themselves um, and the way that they're framed, mm -hmm. um, when you stand in front of them now, you not only have a bodily relation to the figure, um, mm -hmm. but in certain angles, you um, you see your own, um, some glimpse of your mm -hmm. own. So you get the ghosting of the figure, and mm -hmm. you also get um, a kind of uh, self-reflection mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I think at this point, we might open it out to questions from you. I'm sure there are lots of things people want to ask about this work, um, and we'd be delighted, Sandra would be delighted to hear your thoughts or questions about the project. I will ask anyone who has a question to um, please project your question <coughs> for the sake of our recording. Um, you can. I have many more questions. I should keep asking <laughs> one. Well, people think about them. People always need a few minutes to kind of think about what their questions, what their questions are. Um, um, Larissa has a oh. question. I was yeah. wondering Yeah. That reflection is really, really significant in the work. Mm -hmm. and I don't think I'm any more vain than anyone. <laughs> but I, I left, I was almost distracted by that double space effect. 
Yeah. I think, I think that like something that's really interesting is there's always this attempt, especially with the blacked out ones, that there's something about when I ink them and they're wet. And again, like I would, I would sort of echo back to you, I don't think I'm overly vain, but, but there's something about seeing some sort of like really weird ghost distorted image of myself in the wet ink that I was really interested in. And it, it's funny because I always like document that quite a bit in my process. And it's interesting how that kind of insertion of another body immediately, I think, challenges what these images are again. Like it's sort of like, I'm always thinking about how can I insert something into these images to like, I don't know, push back at them in a certain way. And I think like, this is where like, it's really, really interesting because like, so much of like the work in the show is informed by a lot of historical photographers and like thinking about certain sort of ways that they use representation. And um, it's really interesting because Jane has a lot of Andre Cortez and like the distorted bodies. And I'm so in love with that body of work because it's, there's something about this like abstraction with representation that you kind of have to like, you, you sort of don't understand it at first. So like, to me, I think the reflection is like a way to disorient and like also orient at the same time. So it's like you see your own reflection, but then you're trying to kind of like negotiate the image at the same time. And to me, that's all the like slowing down part, right? Like it's like, um, yeah, I think there's something in that that the abstract space kind of gives that to you in a way that like, I don't know, with the larger ones, like to be honest, it's like I'm still kind of figuring that out. <laughs> Yeah. Like, like the use of that word. Yeah. yeah. And there was, um, I guess, uh, what I was trying to get at too is that the ink itself being behind the glass, mm -hmm. it, it's not a reflection of the framing methodology that you use, but in the work itself. Mm -hmm. It pulls you in in a way that's seen my reflection in a lot of mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think that's significant. Yeah. I think it's significant too, and I think it's also significant that choice also instead of a non-reflective material mm -hmm. for glazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that was on purpose, as you, as you mm -hmm. acknowledge. And maybe like as a side note, like it's, I think it's important to reference, like I was working on other projects while I was doing this show and I was really fortunate to be asked to be a part of this exhibition in New York that was in March. Um, with an artist, Ander Mikkelsen, and um, she did this amazing piece uh, in a space in New York called Art in General, which was called A Score for a Black Hole, and she literally excavated into the cement floor, like, and made this black pool of black ink, and, and then she, she, it was funny, a common friend we have uh, was like, I think you two might have a lot in common. And, and then immediately we started to like email and it was like, I love black ink, do you love black ink? Like it was like, <laughs> it's kind of dumb, but. Uh, and then um, anyways, we started to really talk about this idea of like what it, what it meant to have her make this exhibition where she made this black, literal black hole of black ink. And then she invited other artists and people that she felt she had a connection with to perform through this black hole and immediately I was like, well, I want to dip, I want to dip my images in the black hole. And it was really interesting to me because that brought up this idea of the, the double gaze. And I actually, because I was working on this show, I couldn't go to New York to perform. And so I ended up doing this really interesting thing that I've never done before where Andrew and I negotiated a proxy performance. So she ended up performing it with my images. And we did, we negotiated so much over email and it was really interesting to see sort of how then when it was documented to see Anders' reflection in the black pool with her hand. Like there was just all these interesting things where I was like, oh my God, that's like my work. Like it, and we really didn't pre-plan too, too much. But all I said is I wanted her to wear a jumpsuit because I wear jumpsuits a lot. <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, I'm really interested in like women and like ideas of labor and making our work. And um, and in that case, in those images, they were some of, uh, from the same source, um, from the instructional manual, and I actually had put X's through them with a masking fluid. 
So it was like Xing out these images that are really beautiful and then dipping it in the black ink. And what was totally unpredictable um, is that those images, the black ink reacted to the ink in the uh, 1950s process. And they actually turned all psychedelic and they were like green and purple and like, and we were just like, what's happening? And no one else had that with their work. Like everything else was like tinted black, but mine didn't do that, which was like really interesting <laughs> in the end. But I feel like working on that project was like really interesting because of me making these large ones at the time. It started to inform it in a lot of ways. Yeah, and it was also interesting to like really write a lot about that in terms of describing it to another artist. So that's a really work has always been performative in a yeah. way because the early drawings were performative because you had to be in a ladder and you had yeah. to be mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. you had to be very close to images yeah. that can only be seen, in fact, from very yeah. far away. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested, you mentioned Kertes as someone who's influenced yeah. you in terms of his distortions because they were fun and fun mm -hmm. house. Um, you also have, have muses that were yeah. female artists that come from, you know, your 20s and 30s. Can you talk a little about yeah. those artists who mm -hmm. have really influenced your work mm -hmm. and have really, um, you've thought a lot about their place in history? Yeah. Well? So, one of, so, when I've given some other talks um, more recently, I talk about these three muses that, like, they, to me, what's really interesting is, like, because I do align, like, a lot of my references with sort of post World War II, but things sort of leading up to that. and. I think there's something really interesting about being someone who really align as an artist, like aligning myself with like the practice of collage and thinking about the birth of collage and photography and it being this like collision of like really radical activity that was happening. And I've always, and this is where like it's really interesting because like probably I feel like the whole time that Jane and I have known each other, we'll end up in these chats and I'll be, you know, I'll be like, oh, I love Hannah Hawk. And then and Jane's like, oh, you do? And like, we would always have kind of like these discussions about early collage and thinking about propaganda and like really being attracted to that time period. And so for me, the three women that like I always bring up is like Hannah Hawk, who really is like linked to a lot of that collage work I was doing that sort of um, was kind of the stimulus for this kind of folding out of. And then Lee Miller, who was a war, a female war photographer. She was also a muse to Man Ray. Um, and then Merritt Oppenheim, who also was a muse to lots of different Dada and Surrealist artists. Um, but to me, what I was really interested in with these three women, and I've done various work that references them really overtly. Um, I've done projects where I've remade like Merritt Oppenheim's work um, which was a really important thing to me because uh, I really identified with this idea of how she was a reluctant muse. Like she was sort of made, forced into a muse role, but she was always bucking against it and fighting it. Um, and it really actually had hindered a lot of her professional activity was her being made into this muse. And I really, I, again, identified with that power dynamic. And not that I'm, I, I want to be clear, I'm not somehow making it seem like I'm a muse at all. Uh, but I identified, I identified with this idea of like kind of feeling like you can't make work because of expectations and like different sort of things. Um, and so thinking about like these three women to me became a way to kind of have coordinates for me to like understand why I was like really attracted to these images of this time, why I was thinking about collage. And at the same time, I think it's like really important to kind of, they seem very disparate, but to me they're very linked is like, to me the idea of like the birth of like collage was really linked then with like my interest in like, you know, punk and thinking about sort of um, zine culture and like all the things I grew up with in the 90s. And I was doing a lot of research with that and working on projects with people um, because I, I teach a class um, more recently in the last couple of years as I've been making this work that's on radicality and feminism and, um, and resistance. And I was really interested in doing a lot of research about riot girl culture. And to me, it was interesting, like once I revisited all of this kind of 
I would say like things that I really had saturated myself with as a teenage girl, all of a sudden I was like, this isn't very different than like these dada surrealist women. Like that there was like this need to assert identity and a need to kind of be clear about who they were and what they wanted and that they didn't want to be muses or secondary. And so that's sort of like where these things started to kind of cross over. But I always go back to those three women. Like to me, they're like, they very much are the way, they're the filters for me for like how I think about making things and why. And I would like to plug, there's a really great show if people haven't seen mm -hmm. <laughs> at the AGO, which Jane, is, Jane contributed a lot of work to and I got to see it and it's an unbelievable show. It's called Women in Fo Focus, I believe that's the title. But like it has like Hannah Hawk in it, um, it has Jermaine Kroll. It has like a lot of female photographers who were like working during that time period. And um, yeah, I'm so delighted that's up at the AGO while my show's up. Like I was very excited yeah, about that. Show. Yeah. It's curated by Sophie Hackett. It was a photography curator too. So mm -hmm. it's really, really worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so interesting, Sandra. Um, your muses and what you, I just as a, I want to ask you uh, in the public. So has it changed? First wave of feminism, second wave of feminism, has anything changed? I mean, so, you know, I was talking to a dog. We, I was at the AGO opening tonight for this, and here it is purple, and talking to a doctor there, asking the question. A, a great female artist, um, um, say her name. What's that? Zia. Zia. Beautiful Zia Clemens, she's yes. Around with the doctor asking, you know, we were talking about surgeons. So the question became, do, how many orthopedic female surgeons are there? Mm. Is it a male-dominated field? I don't know, in the world of acting, <laughs> are women, is there sexism in that field? Um, I throw it out to the audience. Th there is in the art world? I don't know. What about everybody else's world? Mm -hmm. I, there is in the academic world, obviously. I don't know what other worlds are we in. Well, women still make much less Academia, for sure, that's true. I, I don't know if that's your experience. Both yeah. of you uh, I have been in academia. Is that true? And, yep. And all the universities. <laughs> we could Australia. confirm yeah. that, yep. Okay. <laughs> Ruby and Ryerson, Alberta College of Art. Okay, so you know, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? How does it change? Does art help it change? Does this conversation help that? Is it true in the musical world? Can I just say something? Um, you, you're talking about your process mm -hmm. and your feelings about approaching these images. Uh, it reminds me of a time in an art drawing class at the break. The model came up to me. She was totally nude, mm -hmm. and she was so unconcerned about her nudity mm -hmm. that it was very, very liberating. Mm -hmm. So there, there was no power dynamics in mm -hmm. this conversation, in mm -hmm. this relationship that we had, this mm -hmm. conversation we had. Mm -hmm. And so I come, I sort of start wondering when is power given away and mm -hmm. when is it taken? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you come across overwhelming odds and that power mm -hmm. which is taken away, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. a lot of environmental things that are happening. And you know, there's personal relationships, like you know, the man-woman thing. Mm -hmm. There's also larger human relationships that are taking place that, well, we're, we sort of are a common denominator in there. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really fascinating for me heard you talking about these images, which basically we charge them. Mm -hmm. And like some people can look at these images and be totally blase about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, other people, like their flip of the crank is going to turn you know, three and a half times, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, well, I, I appreciate this, you know, the conversation about your engagement in a process. Mm -hmm. of looking at the community, but I think it's a dialogue that I, that I think about a lot, like the power dynamics. Mm -hmm. I, I thought we'd be equal like years ago, but mm -hmm. I'm just realizing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, and I think too, like on top of that, like there's a power dynamic 
between myself and these women, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm very aware of that and I'm really, like I think this is where like Sarah and I were talking about this the other day when it was like, well, what, you know, like someone had insinuated like this could be potentially violent and we were kind of talking about that and I said, yeah, like I think there is something in these images inherently without me even acting through them that has that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm implicating myself in that, that sort of, that really layered and I think complicated yes. space where, yeah, like it's like, I think when people, like say for, like I of course can't get away from like working in an academic institution where, you know, multiple times a day people are like, oh, well, there's no power dynamics. I'm like, I can literally walk out this door and enact at least 20 of them for you right now. You know, like, or it's like when students will say like, we don't need feminism. And I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, we do. <laughs> like, you know, and it's, it's really disheartening when, because I really think it's a dialogue that needs to keep happening and keep going and like that we need to talk about power dynamics. Like we, like something that's really interesting, I, I bring up a lot, is like my um, last exhibition I had with Jane, which was the collage work, it opened two days after Trump was elected. And it was like screwed up. Like we all felt so upset. The opening was like a downer for sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I think like all I could do in that moment in that dialogue was be like female sexuality, <laughs> like we need it and we, and you know, like, and, really champion like we need to be loud and we need to like yeah. protest and yeah. we need to like challenge things and like, but you could just tell everyone was just like, what is happening? And I think that's also a big part of like all of this and talking about sort of like what, you know, there's what I was going through personally and professionally, but just thinking about like the bigger context of the world and like thinking about, I can't be quiet. I can't sit around and just be like, oh yeah, everything's changed and everything's great, everything's equal. It's not. And I think more than ever, like we have to resist and we have to like do things. And I know for myself, say for instance, like being an educator, that's a big part of it is like working with young students to be like, you need to be vocal and you need to say no to things. So, you know, this class I teach is titled Tell Them I Said No. And so students are always like, yeah, no. And I'm like, okay, great, bye. <laughs> like, you know, like, th because it's something that's like embedded in our consciousness is to be polite and like not say no. And yeah. I don't know, I say no every day and it feels really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and the work has that activism. And yeah. it has even, it's sometimes a dirty word, especially when applied to women. Yeah. It has some anger yeah. in, in it. For um, sure. But it doesn't feel bitter. No, to no, me. no. It feels, it feels, hopeful, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's giving women a voice and it feels hopeful to me. And I love that you've had this long conversation with Jane. I think yeah. the conversation that you've had with Jane is so important. I think the fact that you have aligned with a person who is also um, you know, a pioneer in a world that is really male dominated mm -hmm. um, and that has built a collection that is anchored in giving voice to historical female photographers and that you guys have been able to yeah. have a dialogue around that work for 20 mm -hmm. years is incredible. And mm -hmm. that's so important to bringing this work to yeah. where it is now. Thank you. Is it, you know, the work to me, it seems very empathetic actually. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, 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 kept, it took me time to get to that feeling of it. Mm -hmm. But when I see these works, it's very loving toward these mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and their difficult situation. Mm -hmm. Regardless of all of like what they had to do and why mm -hmm. they had to do it. But it's, they're loving pictures. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I experience them. Is that how you all experience them? Yeah, Aileen. Um, I did have a question earlier, um, but I was a little bit too intimidated to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm glad I saved it to now. Because um, I was just, I saw it earlier about how there's kind of one type of intervention in each mm -hmm. body of work that you mm -hmm. have, either it's the red crayon or it's mm -hmm. the paint. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think like to mirror that, like I think sometimes people think 
if you like keep making work, like somehow then you know what you're doing. <laughs> Which, you know, to a certain extent, yes, but like to another extent, like there's such a high, like when I said I'm cavalier about things, like, you know, even, I don't know if people notice that there's this real reference to like, and I feel like I'm kind of circling back to this a lot, but like thinking about the, the violence in them, I like rip pages out. I like, I'm really clear about ripping and tearing and the speed of that. And like that never comes without like a lot of like, sort of like, I don't know, I, I don't know that how this is gonna go. And um, like there's a collage that Jane has from that older body of work um, that's uh, an image actually from like a really obscure nature book of this snake suffocating a bird. And I was like really into this image. I was like, I love this image so much and it's like I'll never find it again. And then I used like a, a, a sort of uh, inside page of an old edition of a Virginia Woolf book, which meant a lot to me, as like the back page with the tape and it was like really old. and. Um, and I used the ink that I use on these ones. And it's funny because people are always like, oh, this one's so powerful. And I'm like, yeah, I had to kind of get a little drunk to do that one because I was so scared to do it. And it was, it, there was something about having to put myself in that space of like, I knew I was gonna do um, a circle of ink. And I was like, you know, like really, and I did it. And then of course, like the minute I did it, then like one drop of ink fell like misplaced. And I just was like, and it's funny because that came up with one of the, I don't know where, oh, this one here. This always happens to me where I'll just be like, well, I ruined it, you know, like, but these are always the punctuations in the work that I think are so unplanned and they're so unpredictable. And I love that. Like I love the wildness and, and sort of, like I kept, it was funny whenever, friends and people who were supporting me and, and Sarah and Magdalena and Jane were asking about the show, how's it going? I was like, this show's kind of a beast. Like it's sort of like, and I liked that, that it was unruly and it like, I didn't really know how it was gonna turn out every time. Like as much as I knew I'm inking these, I never knew how to predict the outcome. That sounds like, you know, funny, but it's like, I, I I need that in my process to respond to that. And I think that like seeing them now, there's always this inherent trust in that process of doing it over and over and over again. Uh, and maybe that's the optimism is like, we're gonna get this, like we're gonna. <laughs> we're yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please. Can I ask uh, what you were just describing about you get kind of emotional mm -hmm. I think it's like both. I don't, I don't know that like I look at the images and I'm like immediate, like I'm angry. Like it's more, I guess it's when I said it's complicated. It's like a very um, contradictory space to be in, right? It's like, I'm always trying to be really truthful to this idea of like, I feel there's a, um, to me there's a fidelity in my process to like, not being seduced by the things that like, you know, like the fast reads, right? Like I'm always bringing this up when I'm teaching with students because they're used to like everything is like this and I'm like, can we slow down and like really like look at this and talk about what it is that we're looking at? And I'm, I'm very similar in the studio where I think I have to wrestle with, I'm really seduced by how beautiful these images are or this like depiction of this woman and simultaneously I'm angry at the representation of it as well you know like say for instance I think one of the ones that um, is up in the front gallery there and there's quite a few of these is like when I talked about the women censoring their own bodies it's like and I think that's where the empathy is as well it's like they're literally cupping their hands and putting cupped hands in front of their vaginas and you're just kind of like oh like what what is that and it's like um, I think for me, I just, when I make the work, I have to kind of just wrestle with all the different things. So it's like everything you said and more. It's kind of like not knowing, I don't know. Like I think that there's something in actually acting through them that then I feel like something has kind of completed itself. And I'm, 
that's sort of where I end with it, but I'm hoping that in some ways I'm navigating that like complicated space and sort of adding something to it. That's, that's the agenda for me, essentially. Yeah. Yes, I have a question about that as well, because I've been lucky enough to watch. Sorry, I've been lucky enough to watch you work on a lot of these bodies of work over the last few years, uh, and that uh, difficult relationship that you do have with them sometimes, and yeah. you've said a couple times today that you're not really sure uh, if you've resolved the body of work. Are you not sure about the relationship to them or if they're quite completed? Like, I'm wondering, do you, do you feel like you have further to go in this? Obviously, you have further to go in the fight in your relationship with sexism <laughs> and yeah. sort of like the subject matter yeah. of this, but the actual work itself and the process of inking and drawing and blacking stuff out, do you think you'd like to continue with that specific medium or are you ready for a jumping off point? Yeah, I don't think I'm finished with it. Like, I think, I mean, it is interesting. So you, like, you know, in this, like, you totally have witnesses. It's like before I was using black tape to put over things and mask it or highlight it, and then it's the black ink. I kind of always go back to the black, and it's like, it's, to me, it feels really relevant still, and I don't know where it's going to shift. I feel like one of the things I'm really interested in now is, like, how the black, the black abstract space is going to, I don't want to give too much away, but it's like, I feel like in my head now I'm really thinking a lot about pattern, which is kind of a weird thing to throw in, but I'm really interested in this idea of how I can start to kind of fold this into, specifically I'm really interested in camouflage and thinking about how camouflage and these images could like interact or interface with each other. And I'm really interested in the idea of like camouflage was used for different conflicts and like thinking about how these are conflicting images. And so like that's something that's really in my head right now. Um, but I don't know where that's going to go. I haven't started it yet. <laughs> well, there's been one space come of the collage work where you use yeah. the red tape. Eric was going to put some up in the uh, viewing room. If you want mm -hmm. to sit there, it's right after the talk. Mm -hmm. um, for those who haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. Particularly, I think you mentioned the one with the snake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, well, I think we're all intrigued to see how this project develops, and we will look very forward to seeing that. Nope. Do you have any more <laughs> questions? Sure, yeah, no, please. Uh, not quite a question, it's just um, uh, consideration. So you uh, appreciate Hannah Pop, and mm -hmm. uh, you've also used the words that you would need to get something that's what she was doing, mm -hmm. which was the representation of women, mm -hmm. the carrier, something like that, the collage. Um, but I'm thinking of other A little bit, yeah. she, so with these uh, historical representations of women in our history, instead of kind of messing with them, or just, well, she doesn't mess with them, but in a different way, instead of obliterating or destroying them, she occupies them. Like mm -hmm. She inserts her own body mm -hmm. into those, uh, sort of, yeah, those kind of historical mm -hmm. representations of women. So that's mm -hmm. another kind of variation of how one can intervene with that mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's lots of other mm -hmm. uh, different styles of mm -hmm. different strategies that could be mm -hmm. So your work is just, it's interesting to think about your work in relation to those other things. Mm -hmm. When I think, to, like this is really interesting to me because like I think the interventions, like is, I'm always interested in when people, like say for instance with the Red Works, people are like, oh is that, like everyone assumed it was red lipstick when I started to do them, because I always have red lipstick yes. on. And I thought that was really interesting because I talk really openly about, yeah, just signifiers I choose for myself. Like, they're like, this is, this sounds superficial and stupid, but like, it's like, I always get my nails done with this half moon, which is what Lee Miller had in her images. And I'm like really superstitious about these things. And I, I start to think about this idea of the, to me, I, I'm doing it in the way I choose to present myself in the world in, in relation to the work. And so it's like, it's, yeah, I'm curious about how that perform, the, the performative can start to kind of become maybe like more subtle just in terms of like aesthetics in general. But I, I don't know, I'm wondering like what's next. And I think like, you know, someone with, uh, someone like Hannah Hawk, like what I was really interested in was like she would make these massive like image archives and like, 
you know, just organize them. Like, basically, my like dream come true would be to have like a room full of thousands of images <laughs> and just organize images all day, mm -hmm. and like make piles. And like, I'm really interested in that idea of the labor of what that is and that intervention as well. So, it's I don't know. I feel like even that example to me is it like I'm kind of I'm going there. Like it's like I can see sort of things are going in that direction for sure. I think also it's important to be like the black space is me. I always like feel like it's an obvious thing to say, but it, the, to yes. me the black space is my body and how I'm sort of responding to these other bodies and yeah. And something I had said in um, a talk. Yeah, yeah. And it's like something I had shared with the staff when we walked around um, before the show opened is I talked really um, openly about I had hosted, I was asked to host a film screening before I went to New York last spring and it was through uh, Contemporary Calgary and they said, we want artists to choose the most influential films on your practices and I chose Belle de Jour, which is a data surrealist film and I saw that film in Toronto um, through Reg Hart. I don't know if anyone knows Reg Hart that would do screenings in his living room. I saw it when I was like 14. It's like literally my favorite film. And I, I said like the reason I use shiny black is because um, Belle in the film wears this black vinyl trench coat. And she, she really is this like really complicated figure of female sexuality, like she feels repressed in a marriage, but then she's a prostitute during the day. And to me, this black vinyl trench coat, it's like it never leaves my head. <laughs> and I'm always looking for this black vinyl trench coat, so if anyone finds one. Because um, it's like, to me, that like that, just what that coat represented is like why I'm interested in the black still, and like I keep using it, or like the you know, the frames being like a, a black shiny metal, like I, I find like there's these really s kind of simple aesthetic things I keep going to that I'm like, I don't know, like it's just there's something in that and yeah, and I do think this idea of like, yeah, like e the ego and narcissus and all these things, it's like we're always trying to kind of negotiate our own identities through that as well. And I think yeah. there's something very filmic in this whole body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting that you make that Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's such a depth to the work. We could talk about it for another hour again. <laughs> um, but I, I will at this point, I think, invite everyone to um, stay, have a glass of wine, um, spend some more time with the work, by all means pepper Sandra <laughs> with more questions. Um, and to say thank you very much to Sandra for thank sharing. You both. Well, thank you. Thanks.